Really, mon cher compatriote, I am grateful to you for your curiosity. However, there is nothing extraordinary about my story. Since you are interested, I'll tell you that I thought a little about that laugh for a few days, then forgot about it. Once in a great while, I seemed to hear it within me. But most of the time, without making any effort, I thought of other things. Yet I must admit that I ceased to walk along the Paris quays. When I would ride along them in a car or bus, a sort of silence would descend on me. I was waiting, I believe. But I would cross the Seine, nothing would happen, and I would breathe again. I also had some health problems at that time. Nothing definite, a dejection perhaps. A sort of difficulty in recovering my good spirits. I saw doctors who gave me stimulants. I was alternately stimulated and depressed. Life became less easy for me. When the body is sad, the heart languishes. It seemed to me that I was half unlearning what I had never learned, and yet knew so well how to live. Yes, I think it was probably then that everything began. But this evening, I don't feel quite up to snuff either. I even find trouble expressing myself. I'm not talking so well, it seems to me, and my words are less assured. Probably the weather. It's hard to breathe. The air is so heavy, it weighs on one's chest. Would you object, mon cher compatriote, to going out and walking in the town a little? Thank you. How beautiful the canals are this evening. I like the breath of stagnant waters, the smell of dead leaves soaking in the canal and the funereal scent rising from the barges loaded with flowers. No, no, there's nothing morbid about such a taste, I assure you. On the contrary, it's deliberate with me. The truth is that I force myself to admire these canals. What I like most in the world is Sicily, you see, and especially from the top of Etna in the sunlight, provided I dominate the island and the sea. Java, too, but at the time of the trade winds. Yes, I went there in my youth. In a general way, I like all islands. It is easier to dominate them. Charming house, isn't it? The two heads you see up there are heads of Negro slaves. A shop sign. The house belonged to a slave dealer. Oh, they weren't squeamish in those days. They had assurance. They announced, You see, I'm a man of substance. I'm in the slave trade. I deal in black flesh. Can you imagine anyone today making it known publicly that such is his business? What a scandal! I can hear my Parisian colleagues right now. They are adamant on the subject. They wouldn't hesitate to launch two or three manifestos, maybe even more. And on reflection, I'd add my signature to theirs. Slavery? Certainly not. We are against it. That we should be forced to establish it at home or in our factories? Well, that's natural. But boasting about it, that's the limit. I am well aware that one can't get along without domineering or being served. Every man needs slaves as he needs fresh air. Commanding is breathing. You agree with me? And even the most destitute manage to breathe. The lowest man in the social scale still has his wife or his child. If he's unmarried, a dog. The essential thing, after all, is being able to get angry with someone who has no right to talk back. One doesn't talk back to one's father. You know the expression? In one way, it is very odd. To whom should one talk back in this world if not to what one loves? In another way, it is convincing. Somebody has to have the last word. Otherwise, every reason can be answered with another one and there would never be an end to it. Power, on the other hand, settles everything. It took time, but we finally realize that. For instance, you must have noticed that our old Europe at last philosophizes in the right way. We no longer say, as in simple times, this is the way I think. What are your objections? We have become lucid. For the dialogue, we have substituted the communique. This is the truth, we say. You can discuss it as much as you want. We aren't interested. But in a few years, there'll be the police who will show you we are right. Ah, this dear old planet. 
All is clear now. We know ourselves. We now know of what we are capable. Just take me to change examples, if not subjects. I have always wanted to be served with a smile. If the maid looked sad, she poisoned my days. She had a right not to be cheerful, to be sure. But I told myself that it was better for her to perform her service with a laugh than with tears. In fact, it was better for me. Yet, without boasting, my reasoning was not altogether idiotic. Likewise, I always refuse to eat in Chinese restaurants. Why? Because Orientals, when they are silent and in the presence of whites, often look scornful. Naturally, they keep that look when serving. How then can you enjoy the glazed chicken? And above all, how can you look at them and think you are right? Just between us, slavery, preferably with a smile, is inevitable then. But we must not admit it. Isn't it better that whoever cannot do without having slaves should call them free men? For the principle to begin with, and secondly, not to drive them to despair. We owe them that compensation, don't we? In that way, they will continue to smile and we shall maintain our good conscience. Otherwise, we'd be obliged to reconsider our opinion of ourselves. We'd go mad with suffering or even become modest, for everything would be possible. Consequently, no shop signs, and this one is shocking. Besides, if everyone told all, displayed his true profession and identity, we shouldn't know which way to turn. Imagine the visiting cards, DuPont, jittery philosopher, or Christian landowner, or adulterous humanist. Indeed, there's a wide choice, but it would be hell. Yes, hell must be like that. Streets filled with shop signs and no way of explaining oneself. One is classified once and for all. You, for instance, mon cher compatriot, stop and think of what your sign would be. You are silent? Well, you'll tell me later on. I know mine in any case. A double face, a charming Janus, and above it the motto of the house. Don't rely on it. On my cards. Jean-Baptiste Clemence, play actor. Why, shortly after the evening I told you about, I discovered something. When I would leave a blind man on the sidewalk to which I had convoyed him, I used to tip my hat to him. Obviously the hat tipping wasn't intended for him since he couldn't see it. To whom was it addressed? To the public. After playing my part, I would take the bow. Not bad, eh? Another day during the same period, to a motorist who was thanking me for helping him, I replied that no one would have done as much. I meant, of course, anyone. But that unfortunate slip weighed heavy on me. For modesty, really, I took the cake. I have to admit it humbly, mon cher compatriot, I was always bursting with vanity. I, I, I is the refrain of my whole life, which could be heard in everything I said. I could never talk without boasting, especially if I did so with that shattering discretion that was my specialty. It is quite true that I always lived free and powerful. I simply felt released in regard to all for the excellent reason that I recognized no equals. I always considered myself more intelligent than everyone else, as I've told you, but also more sensitive and more skillful. A crack shot, an incomparable driver, a better lover. Even in the fields in which it was easy for me to verify my inferiority, like tennis, for instance, in which I was but a passable partner. It was hard for me not to think that, with a little time for practice, I would surpass the best players. I admitted only superiorities in me, and this explained my goodwill and serenity. When I was concerned with others, I was so out of pure condescension, in utter freedom, and all the credit went to me. My self-esteem would go up a degree. Along with a few other truths, I discovered these facts little by little in the period following the evening I told you about. Not all at once, nor very clearly. First, I had to recover my memory. By gradual digress, I saw more clearly, I learned a little of what I knew. Until then, I had always been aided by an extraordinary ability to forget. 
I used to forget everything, beginning with my resolutions. Fundamentally, nothing mattered. War, suicide, love, poverty got my attention, of course. When circumstances forced me, but a courteous, superficial attention. At times, I would pretend to get excited about some cause foreign to my daily life. But basically, I didn't really take part in it, except, of course, when my freedom was thwarted. How can I express it? Everything slid off. Yes, just rolled off me. In the interest of fairness, it should be said that sometimes my forgetfulness was praiseworthy. You have noticed that there are people whose religion consists in forgiving all offences, and who do in fact forgive them, but never forget them. I wasn't good enough to forgive offences, but eventually I always forgot them. And the man who thought I hated him couldn't get over seeing me tip my hat to him with a smile. According to his nature, he would then admire my nobility of character or scorn my ill-breeding without realising that my reason was simpler. I had forgotten his very name. The same infirmity that often made me indifferent or ungrateful in such cases made me magnanimous. I lived consequently without any other continuity than that from day to day of I, I, I. From day to day, women from day to day, virtue or vice from day to day, like dogs. But every day myself, secure at my post. Thus, I progressed on the surface of life, in the realm of words as it were, never in reality. All those books barely read, those friends barely loved, those cities barely visited, those women barely possessed. I went through the gestures out of boredom or absent-mindedness. Then came human beings. They wanted to cling, but there was nothing to cling to, and that was unfortunate for them. As for me, I forgot. I never remembered anything but myself. Gradually, however, my memory returned. Or rather, I returned to it, and in it, I found the recollection that was awaiting me. But before telling you of it, allow me, mon cher compatriote, to give you a few examples. They will be useful to you, I am sure, of what I discovered in the course of my exploration. One day in my car, when I was slow in making a getaway at the green light, while our patient fellow citizens immediately began honking furiously behind me, I suddenly remembered another occasion set in similar circumstances. A motorcycle ridden by a spare little man wearing spectacles and plus fours had gone around me and planted itself in front of me at the red light. As he came to a stop, the little man had stalled his motor and was vainly striving to revive it. When the light changed, I asked him with my usual courtesy to take his motorcycle out of my way so I might pass. The little man was getting irritable over his wheezy motor. Hence he replied, according to the rules of Parisian courtesy, that I could go climb a tree. I insisted, still polite, but with a slight shade of impatience in my voice. I was immediately told that in any case I could go straight to hell. Meanwhile, several horns began to be heard behind me. With greater firmness, I begged my interlocutor to be polite and to realise that he was blocking traffic. The irascible character, probably exasperated by the now evident ill will of his motor, informed me that if I wanted what he called a thorough dusting off, he would gladly give it to me. Such cynicism filled me with a healthy rage, and I got out of my car with the intention of thrashing this coarse individual. I don't think I am cowardly, but what doesn't one think? I was a head taller than my adversary, and my muscles have always been reliable. I still believe the dusting off would have been received rather than given. But I had hardly set foot on the pavement when from the gathering crowd a man stepped forth, rushed at me, assured me that I was the lowest of the low and that he would not allow me to strike a man who had a motorcycle between his legs and hence was at a disadvantage. I turned toward this musketeer and, in truth, didn't even see him. Indeed, Hardly had I turned my head when, almost simultaneously, I heard the motorcycle begin popping again and received a violent blow on the ear. Before I had the time to register what had happened, the motorcycle rode away. 
Dazed, I mechanically walked toward D'Artagnan when, at the same moment, an exasperated concert of horns rose from the now considerable line of vehicles. The light was changing to green. Then, still somewhat bewildered, instead of giving a drubbing to the idiot who had addressed me, I docilely returned to my car and drove off. As I passed, the idiot greeted me with a poor dope that I still recall. A totally insignificant story, in your opinion. Probably. Still, it took me some time to forget it, and that's what counts. Yet I had excuses. I had let myself be beaten without replying, but I could not be accused of cowardice. Taken by surprise, addressed from both sides, I had mixed everything up, and the horns had put the finishing touch to my embarrassment. Yet I was unhappy about this, as if I had violated the code of honor. I could see myself getting back into my car without a reaction, under the ironic gaze of a crowd, especially delighted because, as I recall, I was wearing a very elegant blue suit. I could hear the poor dope, which, in spite of everything, struck me as justified. In short, I had collapsed in public. As a result of a series of circumstances, to be sure, but there are always circumstances. As an afterthought, I clearly saw what I should have done. I saw myself felling D'Artagnan with a good hook to the jaw, getting back into my car, pursuing the monkey who had struck me, overtaking him, jamming his machine against the curb, taking him aside and giving him the licking he had fully deserved. With a few variants, I ran off this little film a hundred times in my imagination. But it was too late, and for several days I chewed a bitter resentment. Why, it's raining again. Let's stop, shall we, under this portico. Good. Where was I? Oh yes, honour. Well, when I recovered the recollection of that episode, I realised what it meant. After all, my dream had not stood up to facts. I had dreamed, this was now clear, of being a complete man who managed to make himself respected in his person as well as in his profession. Half Serdan, half de Gaulle, if you will. In short, I wanted to dominate in all things. This is why I assumed the man Nair made a particular point of displaying my physical skill rather than my intellectual gifts. But after having been struck in public without reacting, it was no longer possible for me to cherish that fine picture of myself. If I had been the friend of truth and intelligence I claimed to be, what would that episode have mattered to me? It was already forgotten by those who had witnessed it. I'd have barely accused myself of having got angry over nothing, and also, having got angry, of not having managed to face up to the consequences of my anger for want of presence of mind. Instead of that, I was eager to get my revenge, to strike and conquer. As if my true desire were not to be the most intelligent or most generous creature on earth, but only to beat anyone I wanted, to be the stronger, in short, and in the most elementary way. The truth is that every intelligent man, as you know, dreams of being a gangster and of ruling over society by force alone. As it is not so easy, as the detective novels might lead one to believe, one generally relies on politics and joins the cruelest party. What does it matter, after all, if by humiliating one's mind, one succeeds in dominating everyone? I discovered in myself sweet dreams of oppression. I learned at least that I was on the side of the guilty, the accused, only in exactly so far as their crime caused me no harm. Their guilt made me eloquent because I was not its victim. When I was threatened, I became not only a judge in turn, but even more. An irascible master who wanted, regardless of all laws, to strike down the offender and get him on his knees. After that, mon cher compatriot, it is very hard to continue seriously believing one has a vocation for justice and is the predestined defender of the widow and orphan. Since the rain is coming down harder and we have the time, may I impart to you another discovery I made soon after in my memory. Let's sit down on this bench out of the rain. For centuries, pipe smokers have been watching the same rain falling on the same canal. What I have to tell you is a bit more difficult. 
This time, it concerns a woman. To begin with, you must know that I always succeeded with women, and without much effort. I don't say succeed in making them happy, or even in making myself happy through them. No, simply succeed. I used to achieve my ends. Just about whenever I wanted, I was considered to have charm. Fancy that. You know what charm is. A way of getting the answer yes, without having asked any clear question. And that was true of me at the time. Does that surprise you? Come now, don't deny it. With the face I now have, that's quite natural. Alas, after a certain age, every man is responsible for his face. Mine. But what matter? It's a fact. I was considered to have charm, and I took advantage of it. Without calculation, however, I was in good faith, or almost. My relationship with women was natural, free, easy, as the saying goes. No guile in it, except that obvious guile which they look upon as a homage. I loved them, according to the hallowed expression, which amounts to saying that I never loved any of them. I always considered misogyny vulgar and stupid, and almost all the women I have known seemed to me better than I. Nevertheless, setting them so high, I made use of them more often than I served them. How can one make it out? Of course, true love is exceptional, two or three times a century, more or less. The rest of the time there is vanity or boredom. As for me, in any case, I was not the Portuguese nun. I'm not hard-hearted, far from it, full of pity on the contrary, and with a ready tear to boot. Only my emotional impulses always turn toward me, my feelings of pity concern me. It is not true, after all, that I never loved. I conceived at least one great love in my life, of which I was always the object. From that point of view, after the inevitable hardships of youth, I was early focused. Sensuality alone dominated my love life. I looked merely for objects of pleasure and conquest. Moreover, I was aided in this by my constitution. Natura had been generous with me. I was considerably proud of this and derived many satisfactions therefrom without my knowing now whether they were physical or based on prestige. Of course you will say that I am boasting again. I shan't deny it and I am hardly proud of doing so, for here I am boasting of what is true. In any case, my sensuality, to limit myself to it, was so real that even for a ten-minute adventure I'd have disowned father and mother, even were I to regret it bitterly. Indeed, especially for a ten-minute adventure, and even more so if I was sure it was to have no sequel. I had principles, to be sure, such as that the wife of a friend is sacred. But I simply ceased quite sincerely, a few days before, to feel any friendship for the husband. Maybe I ought not to call this sensuality. Sensuality is not repulsive. Let's be indulgent and use the word infirmity, a sort of congenital inability to see in love anything but the physical. That infirmity, after all, was convenient. Combined with my faculty for forgetting, it favoured my freedom. At the same time, through a certain appearance of inaccessibility and unshakable independence it gave me, it provided the opportunity for new successes. As a result of not being romantic, I gave romance something to work on. Our feminine friends have in common with Bonaparte the belief that they can succeed where everyone else has failed. In this exchange, moreover, I satisfied something in addition to my sensuality, my passion for gambling. I loved in women my partners in a certain game which had at least the taste of innocence. You see, I can't endure being bored and appreciate only diversions in life. Any society, however brilliant, soon crushes me, whereas I have never been bored with the women I liked. It hurts me to confess it, but I'd have given ten conversations with Einstein for an initial rendezvous with a pretty chorus girl. It's true that at the tenth rendezvous I was longing for Einstein or a serious book. In short, I was never concerned with the major problems except in the intervals between my little excesses, and how often standing on the sidewalk involved in a passionate discussion with friends. I lost the thread of the argument being developed 
because a devastating woman was crossing the street at that very moment. Hence, I played the game. I knew they didn't like one to reveal one's purpose too quickly. First, there had to be conversation, fond attentions, as they say. I wasn't worried about speeches, being a lawyer, nor about glances, having been an amateur actor during my military service. I often changed parts, but it was always the same play. For instance, the scene of the incomprehensible attraction, of the mysterious something, of the it's unreasonable. I certainly didn't want to be attracted. I was even tired of love, etc. Always worked, though it is one of the oldest in the repertory. There was also the gambit of the mysterious happiness no other woman has ever given you. It may be a blind alley. Indeed, it surely is, for one cannot protect oneself too much. But it just happens to be unique. Above all, I had perfected a little speech which was always well received and which, I am sure, you will applaud. The essential part of that act lay in the assertion, painful and resigned, that I was nothing, that it was not worth getting involved with me, that my life was elsewhere and not related to everyday happiness. A happiness that maybe I should have preferred to anything. But there you were. It was too late. As to the reasons behind this decisive lateness, I maintained secrecy, knowing that it is always better to go to bed with a mystery. In a way, moreover, I believed what I said. I was living my part. It is not surprising that my partners likewise began to tread the boards enthusiastically. The most sensitive among them tried to understand me, and that effort led them to melancholy surrenders. The others, satisfied to note that I was respecting the rules of the game and had the tactfulness to talk before acting, progressed without delay to the realities. This meant I had won, and twice over, since, besides the desire I felt for them, I was satisfying the love I bore myself by verifying each time my special powers. This is so true that even if some among them provided but slight pleasure, I nevertheless tried to resume relations with them at long intervals, helped doubtless by that strange desire kindled by absence and a suddenly recovered complicity, but also to verify the fact that our ties still held and that it was my privilege alone to tighten them. Sometimes I went so far as to make them swear not to give themselves to any other man in order to quiet my worries once and for all on that score. My heart, however, played no part in that worry, nor even my imagination. A certain type of pretension was in fact so personified in me that it was hard for me to imagine, despite the facts, that a woman who had once been mine could ever belong to another. But the oath they swore to me liberated me while it bound them. As soon as I knew they would never belong to anyone, I could make up my mind to break off, which otherwise was almost always impossible for me. As far as they were concerned, I had proved my point once and for all and assured my power for a long time. Strange, isn't it? But that's the way it was, mon cher compatriot. Some cry, love me. Others, don't love me. But a certain genus, the worst and most unhappy, cries, don't love me and be faithful to me. Except that the proof is never definitive, after all. One has to begin again with each new person. As a result of beginning over and over again, one gets in the habit. Soon the speech comes without thinking and the reflex follows. And one day you find yourself taking without really desiring. Believe me, for certain men at least, not taking what one doesn't desire is the hardest thing in the world. This is what happened eventually, and there's no point in telling you who she was, except that, without really stirring me, she had attracted me by her passive, avid manner. Frankly, it was a shabby experience, as I should have expected. But I never had any complexes and soon forgot the person whom I didn't see again. I thought she hadn't noticed anything and didn't even imagine she could have an opinion. Besides, in my eyes, her passive manner cut her off from the world. A few weeks later, however, I learned that she had related my deficiencies to a third person. At once, I felt as if I had been somewhat deceived. 
She wasn't so passive as I had thought, and she didn't lack judgment. Then I shrugged my shoulders and pretended to laugh. I even laughed outright. Clearly, the incident was unimportant. If there is any realm in which modesty ought to be the rule, isn't it sex with all the unforeseeable there is in it? But no, each of us tries to show up to advantage, even in solitude. Despite having shrugged my shoulders, what was my behavior, in fact? I saw that woman again a little later and did everything necessary to charm her and really take her back. It was not very difficult, for they don't like either to end on a failure. From that moment onward, without really intending it, I began, in fact, to mortify her in every way. I would give her up and take her back, force her to give herself at inappropriate times and in inappropriate places, treat her so brutally in every regard that eventually I attached myself to her as I imagine the jailer is bound to his prisoner. And this kept up till the day when, in the violent disorder of painful and constrained pleasure, she paid a tribute aloud to what was enslaving her. That very day, I began to move away from her. I have forgotten her since. I'll agree with you, despite your polite silence, that that adventure is not very pretty. But just think of your life, mon cher compatriote. Search your memory, and perhaps you will find some similar story that you'll tell me later on. In my case, when that business came to mind, I again began to laugh. But it was another kind of laugh, rather like the one I had heard on the Pont des Arts. I was laughing at my speeches and my pleadings in court, even more at my court pleading than at my speeches to women. To them, at least, I did not lie much. Instinct spoke clearly without subterfuges in my attitude. The act of love, for instance, is a confession. Selfishness screams aloud, vanity shows off, or else true generosity reveals itself. Ultimately, in that regrettable story, even more than in my other affairs, I had been more outspoken than I thought. I had declared who I was and how I could live. Despite appearances, I was therefore more worthy in my private life, even when, one might say, especially when, I behaved as I have told you, than in my great professional flights about innocence and justice. At least, seeing myself act with others, I couldn't deceive myself as to the truth of my nature. No man is a hypocrite in his pleasures. Have I read that, or did I think it myself, mon cher compatriote? When I examined thus the trouble I had in separating definitively from a woman, a trouble which used to involve me in so many simultaneous liaisons, I didn't blame my soft-heartedness. That was not what impelled me when one of my mistresses, tired of waiting for the austerlitz of our passion and spoke of leaving me, at once I was the one who made a step forward, who yielded, who became eloquent. As for affection and soft-heartedness, I aroused them in women, experiencing merely the appearance of them myself. Simply a little excited by this refusal, alarmed also by the possible loss of someone's affection. At times, I truly thought I was suffering, to be sure. But the rebellious female had merely to leave in fact for me to forget her without effort, as I forgot her presence when, on the contrary, she had decided to return. No, it was not love or generosity that awakened me when I was in danger of being forsaken, but merely the desire to be loved and to receive what in my opinion was due me. The moment I was loved and my partner again forgotten, I shone, I was at the top of my form, I became likeable. Be it said, moreover, that as soon as I had re-won that affection, I became aware of its weight. In my moments of irritation, I told myself that the ideal solution would have been the death of the person I was interested in. Her death would, on the one hand, have definitively fixed our relationship and, on the other, removed its compulsion. But one cannot long for the death of everyone or, in the extreme, depopulate the planet in order to enjoy a freedom that cannot be imagined otherwise. My sensibility was opposed to this, and my love of mankind. The only deep emotion I occasionally felt in these affairs was gratitude, when all was going well and I was left not only peace but freedom to come and go. Never kinder and gayer with one woman 
than when I had just left another's bed, as if I extended to all others the debt I had just contracted toward one of them. In any case, however apparently confused my feelings were, the result I achieved was clear. I kept all my affections within reach to make use of them when I wanted. On my own admission, I could live happily only on condition that all the individuals on earth, or the greatest possible number, were turned toward me, eternally in suspense, devoid of independent life and ready to answer my call at any moment, doomed in short to sterility until the day I should deign to favour them. In short, for me to live happily, it was essential for the creatures I chose not to live at all. They must receive their life sporadically only at my bidding. Oh, I don't feel any self-satisfaction, believe me, in telling you this. Upon thinking of that time when I used to ask for everything without paying anything myself, when I used to mobilise so many people in my service, when I used to put them in the refrigerator, so to speak, in order to have them at hand some day when it would suit me, I don't know how to name the odd feeling that comes over me. Isn't it shame, perhaps? Tell me, mon cher compatriote, doesn't shame sting a little? It does? Well, it's probably shame then, or one of those silly emotions that have to do with honour. It seems to me, in any case, that that feeling has never left me since the adventure I found at the heart of my memory, which I cannot any longer put off relating, despite my digressions and the inventive efforts for which, I hope, you give me credit. Look, the rain has stopped. Be kind enough to walk home with me. I am strangely tired, not from having talked so much, but at the mere thought of what I still have to say. Oh, well, a few words will suffice to relate my essential discovery. What's the use of saying more, anyway? For the statue to stand bare, the fine speeches must take flight like pigeons. So here goes. That particular night in November, two or three years before the evening when I thought I heard laughter behind me, I was returning to the left bank and my home by way of the Pont Royal. It was an hour past midnight. A fine rain was falling, a drizzle rather, that scattered the few people on the streets. I had just left a mistress, who was surely already asleep. I was enjoying that walk, a little numbed, my body calmed and irrigated by a flow of blood, gentle as the falling rain. On the bridge, I passed behind a figure, leaning over the railing and seeming to stare at the river. On closer view, I made out a slim young woman dressed in black. The back of her neck, cool and damp between her dark hair and coat collar, stirred me. But I went on after a moment's hesitation. At the end of the bridge, I followed the guys toward Saint-Michel, where I lived. I had already gone some fifty yards when I heard the sound, which, despite the distance, seemed dreadfully loud in the midnight silence of a body striking the water. I stopped short, but without turning around. Almost at once, I heard a cry, repeated several times, which was going downstream. Then it suddenly ceased. The silence that followed, as the night suddenly stood still, seemed interminable. I wanted to run, and yet didn't stir. I was trembling, I believe, from cold and shock. I told myself that I had to be quick, and I felt an irresistible weakness steal over me. I have forgotten what I thought then. Too late, too far, or something of the sort. I was still listening as I stood motionless. Then, slowly under the rain, I went away. I informed no one. But here we are. Here's my house. My shelter. Tomorrow? Yes, if you wish. I'd like to take you to the island of Marken, so you can see the Zuida Z. Let's meet at 11 at Mexico City. What? That woman? Oh, I don't know. Really, I don't know. The next day and the days following, I didn't read the papers.